Greetings to everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the sixth seminar of Climate Change and Love Laboratory of Kadir Has University School of Law. In the previous sessions of our seminar series, we had a chance to look at different problems associated with the climate crisis and its effects in various fields of law. Today, we will touch upon the trends in climate change legislation with an aim to understand how states reacted in their struggle against the climate change by enacting new climate related laws. We are so delighted and honored to host Professor Dr. Sam Penkhauser, who is a professor of climate economics and policy at the University of Oxford, where he is affiliated with the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment and the School of Geography and the Environment. Before moving to Oxford, Professor Sam Penkhauser was director of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment at the London School of Economics, where he still remains a visiting professor. He has worked at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, where he was deputy chief economist. He also worked at the World Bank and the Global Environment Facility. He is currently director of Oxford Net Zero Project. He has studied economics at the University of Bern, the London School of Economics and University College London. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation, Professor Fenkhauser. Now the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the warm introduction and thank you for the invitation to join this, uh, this seminar series. Uh, uh, you have a, a great program. I, I've seen some of the, the speakers you, you have had and have invited. So it's, it's uh, I'm sort of an honor to be in, uh, honored to be in, in, in that company. Uh, so as, as we just heard, I'm going to talk about trends in climate legislation. Uh, and I should sort of precede that by saying I'm, a, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm, I'm an economist and policy specialist by background. Uh, but I'm interested, uh, therefore, not so much in the in the sort of the content of legislation, as it were, but uh, in 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 what those what those laws achieve, and what those uh, how those laws come about, the sort of political economy of passing climate change legislation, who passes those laws, and and, and what happens once they uh, once they're enforced, and once they're on the, the statute book. So that's the plan. Um, let's see if I can. Change my screen here, which is frozen at the moment. Let's see what I can do here. Okay, let's just see. Now it should work. There we go. Um, so that's the, the, the plan of the, the next sort of 45 minutes or so before we move into question and answers. And I'm sort of mostly excited about the question and answers actually to uh, have a chance to engage with you. But before we do that, three things I uh, would like to cover. I'll give you a little bit of a, a context which most of or all of you will, will be familiar with as to where climate change legislation fits in the, in the, in the sort of the, the fight against climate change. Uh, I would then say a few words about progress, past progress in passing climate laws and, and sort of putting in place policies. Uh, that's the sort of questions we, which excite me that I just mentioned, who passes those laws um, and uh, what, what, what do they achieve? Actually, the, the, the third bit is then what do those laws achieve? And that part I will focus uh, mostly, not exclusively, but mostly on uh, the UK situation, that's uh, where I am based, and that's the sort of the context I understand best. Uh, but it's also because the UK Climate Change Law, uh, the Climate Change Act of 2008, is, a, is, is actually quite a, a, good, a good case study. It's a good law to uh, look at, and it's a good institutional context to understand. So that's the third thing I'm hoping to do uh, before we get into Q&A. So let's start with uh, the environmental context. And again, that's something that most of, if not all of you will understand. Um, 
climate change legislation and the fight against climate change um, has an international focus now, has an international governance architecture around the, the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement uh, is, is, uh, is the international treaty that sets the, sort of the global ambition, the global objectives of, of where we want to uh, end up on, on climate change in terms of what climate change risks we find acceptable. And then that filters down into international legislation and, and climate legislation. Um, the Paris Agreement is also the, the treaty that has given us the, um, sort of the, the focus on, on net zero emissions. And climate change legislation increasingly is about pathways towards meeting net zero emissions. So that's, that's what we are trying to achieve. For, for a lot of people, net zero is, is simply a sort of a shorthand of saying, uh, I want to be compliant with the Paris Agreement. You know, companies and countries that uh, commit to net zero targets, usually that's a shorthand of saying, I am a part of the Paris Agreement. I agree with the objectives of the Paris Agreement, the temperature goal of well below two degrees. I want to be part of that. I want to make a contribution to that. But net zero actually comes out of the out of the physics, it comes out of the science. And whatever your temperature target is, you will need to achieve net zero at some point. Uh, greenhouse gases, CO2 in particular, as, as, as you will all know, are, are stock pollutants. It is the accumulation of the gas in the atmosphere that does the damage. And therefore, the finite budgets associated with each temperature target, whatever that temperature target might be, at some point the accumulation of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere is such that uh, the temperature target is breached and, and you have to uh, stop uh, uh, emitting CO2 into the atmosphere at that point. So even though net zero has sort of come to us in governance terms through the Paris Agreement, it actually is a, a very scientific uh, 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 concept driven by uh, sort of empirical relationships uh, in, in the atmosphere. Uh, you're familiar with the pathways that the scientists have uh, calculated to, uh, to be compatible with the Paris objective of well below two degrees. Those are pathways that reflect the amount of carbon that we still have uh, remaining, the carbon budget that we have remaining to, uh, to stay within well below two degrees. And the question is, how does one allocate that remaining carbon budget over time? We can emit it all very early on and, and then have to reach net zero uh, quite quickly, or we can spread out the remaining carbon budget over a longer period of time. And if you sort of try to have an efficient and rational approach about how quickly you use up the, the remaining carbon budget, you get emission paths that look a little bit like the one we're looking at here. And those are emission paths that sort of involve cutting global CO2 emissions by about half uh, in the next 10 years or so, and then using up the entire carbon budget that we have left by the middle of the century, at which point we have to reach that balance between uh, emitting carbon into the atmosphere and removing it from the atmosphere into sinks, either geological or biological sinks. So that's the story, that's the environmental story of the Paris Agreement, and that's the context within which climate legislation happens, or it's the environmental context within uh, which climate legislation happens. There's also an economic context within which um, climate legislation happens, and actually the, the, the net zero uh, uh, the decarbonization pathways happen. And that economic context looks a little bit like the left-hand side of this chart here. It's a story of continued uh, economic development. Um, uh, the, the world is, is, is hopefully growing richer. We continue to invest. We continue to, uh, in a sustainable way, we become more prosperous. And if you sort of juxtapose that economic growth with the uh, emission reduction pathway on the right, you sort of start getting a sense 
of what uh, what we have to achieve, what climate legislation and policy has to achieve. The story on the right is about reducing emissions by 50% in 10 years and then completely within 30 years. The economic story on the left uh, is one of doubling uh, the world's infrastructure uh, stock uh, within maybe 15 years or so. So all the, the roads, the bridges, the power systems, the water uh, uh, networks that we currently have, we're going to build all that again in the next 15 years or so. So a huge, huge amount of investment in infrastructure. At the same time, GDP, uh, sort of normal growth, growth rates that we have observed in the past imply that GDP will probably double within 20 years. So everything we currently produce and consume, uh, all the cars, all the services, all the steel, all the cement, everything we currently produce, we will produce the same amount again. And a similar story when it comes to, to buildings, urban populations are going up, people are moving to cities, uh, the urban population is expected to double uh, in, in, in a generation or so, and those people have to live somewhere, and so the implication is that all the buildings we currently have, all the urban dwellings, uh, we have to build that building stock again, so we have to, all the Istanbul's, the London's, the New York's, the Shanghai's, we have to build all those cities again over the next or the, the same amount of cities again over the next generation or so. So that's the, the sort of the tension between reaching net zero and really bringing down emissions very, very fast versus continuing to invest in prosperity, into human well-being, into development. And on the one hand, that's a, as a risk. Because if we build that infrastructure and those cities in the wrong way, we are really locking in continued high carbon activity. But it's also an opportunity because if we build those cities and that infrastructure in a zero carbon way, um, we are locking in a sustainable uh, way to prosperity. So that's that's the sort of the, the tension between um, emission reductions and economic development, both as an opportunity and as a threat. And that's the context within which we do climate policy, within which we do climate legislation. Just one more word on context, national climate legislation. I'll be mostly talking about climate laws passed by national governments, but of course national governments are only one uh, of many players uh, that, that are pushing for climate action. I'm giving you six here on this slide, so six trends that are really that make me optimistic, actually, that we can meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement, because um, lots of, of communities, lots of actors, lots of decision makers are, are, are pushing towards more climate action. We mentioned the international diplomacy there in the middle of the screen. That is complemented by, by things that happen at the grassroots. Um, we all know about the school strikes and the sort of the push by civil society. That's made a huge difference to the awareness that we have and the willingness that people have to take climate action. Very, very powerful. Most parents listen to their kids. And I have colleagues who got into climate change because they got a hard time from their children at home. So this is a, a sort of a powerful uh, driver of climate action at the moment, uh, is the, the civil society uh, uh, drive. Uh, but also the, the local communities that that's starting to take climate action. The sort of more official side of, of, of uh, economic activity is also getting into, into climate change. Uh, we see businesses really being very serious about the climate change opportunities. It's not just Tesla, the thing I put here on the screen. There's a big um, green economy around now, around batteries, uh, climate resilience, uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, and, 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 and sort of finance and services. And that green economy is now as big uh, globally in terms of revenue as the, as the global oil and gas uh, economy. So the, the green economy is, is, is now here. Uh, and finance is, is, is uh, uh, sort of underwriting and, and supporting uh, that that green that green economy. 
The final uh, picture you there have is on the courts. You will know uh, as, 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 a, as a legal community that uh, courts are increasingly uh, being asked to opine, to rule uh, on, on climate change issues. And that's again, another powerful driver towards more climate action. It reinforces um, uh, the drive towards climate legislation, but it is also uh, uh, a sort of the, the implementing uh, uh, phase of, of climate legislation. I will have a, just one slide on, on uh, climate litigation later on. But this was a bit of context. This is the context in which uh, countries, parliaments and governments are legislating about uh, climate change. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, looking back a little bit and ask how much climate legislation is there in the world and how has it come about and what do those laws contain? So that's what we're going to do next. And this chart here is, is the entry point uh, into that question. It's a summary of a detailed database which I helped put together at the London School of Economics. It's called Climate Change Laws of the World. And it contains uh, by now probably close to two and a half thousand uh, laws, policies, executive orders um, that are relevant to climate change. So those are things that uh, either have to do with clean energy, maybe with energy efficiency, maybe with clean transport. Some of them are about agriculture, about land use change. There's a certain amount of legislation that has to do with climate resilience and with adaptation. Um, some of them are very operational. You know, they, they put in place standards or, 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 or incentive schemes. Some of them, and the more interesting ones, sort of more systemic ones, if you will, are, are framework laws. Uh, those are overarching climate laws that define the institutional context within which climate policy in a country will happen or should happen. And most countries in the world actually now have a version of a framework law. Uh, they have some policy, some executive order or some parliamentary act that defines the approach of a country to climate change. Uh, so there isn't a single country uh, at, the, at this point in time that doesn't uh, legislate or intervene on climate change. You see the color coding on the map, um, which shows you the number of climate laws that are on the statute books in, in different countries. Uh, basically, the, the, the sort of the redder the, the, the color, the more laws there are. And you see countries uh, with, 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 quite, with, with over 20 uh, laws that are relevant, laws and policies that are relevant to climate change. The UK is one of them, but uh, and a lot of the European countries fall into that category. But you also see countries like Brazil and Indonesia there with, with, with quite high density of uh, climate legislation. Now that so points towards a, a, a caveat. The number of laws isn't uh, necessarily a perfect indicator of environmental action. You can have a lot of laws uh, that are weak or badly enforced, and that doesn't therefore then translate into, into a lot of environmental action. But it is a good indicator to see um, just uh, how much attention from, from the legal community, from the parliamentary community that, that the climate change gets. I mentioned those overarching climate change uh, frameworks that a lot of countries have put in place. And here on the left-hand side of this chart, I'm giving you a few examples of what I mean by those types of uh, uh, framework laws. Um, this is a sort of a set of, of, of framework laws that, that really sort of are good examples of, of, of that overarching uh, mindset of, of climate governance. The UK Climate Change Act in the country, in my country where I live, um, is, 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 is an example that's often mentioned, and I will use the Climate Change Act later on as a, as a case study. Um, but there are, other, there are other laws that sometimes are actually um, mirrored a little bit on the Climate Change Act. If you look at the Mexican General Law on Climate Change, which is passed 10 years ago, four years about the UK, after the UK Act, it has a lot of similar features 
uh, as to the UK Act, the Swedish Climate Change Act and the New Zealand uh, Climate Change Response Amendment Act right at the bottom there of the list. Those are other examples of laws that, that have similar structures to the UK Act that sort of set in place processes, establish institutions, define responsibilities on climate change. It isn't all a sort of industrialized country story. We see here um, uh, legislative uh, uh, climate change acts in, in countries like Kenya, so in middle income countries. Um, I've mentioned Mexico already as an example of a climate change act in a country that has a, a, a quite high reliance on, on actually on, on fossil fuels on, on, on by prominent oil sector, but they still pass climate legislation. Let me point out South Korea as well on this list. It's an interesting law because it isn't a law just about climate change. It's a law about low carbon green growth. So South Korea, uh, you know, quite early on, um, quite in a visionary way, decided that climate change wasn't just about environmental compliance. It was also about prosperity. It was also about building a new green economy. And the South Korean framework law on climate change quite deliberately uh, promotes that economic side of the agenda. It isn't just about reducing emissions, it is about supporting the Korean economy in becoming world leaders in the, in the coming green economy, in the coming zero carbon economy. So that was quite a deliberate broadening uh, of the scope of climate legislation in, in South Korea. And many other countries have actually sort of latched on uh, to that and, and green growth is now often uh, a parallel objective. China uh, is the final country on this list that I want to quickly highlight uh, for two reasons. One is China also has the same deliberate economic focus as South Korea on not just wanting to reduce emissions, but also wanting to create a powerful zero carbon economy that can be a, a sort of a, an export leader and an economic engine of growth uh, for China. The other reason why China is interesting is uh, it isn't that China's uh, climate objectives are not enshrined in a parliamentary act. They're enshrined in the five-year plans. So those, those are government documents as opposed to parliamentary documents. But this is the way in, in the Chinese uh, governance system, and many of you will understand it a lot better than, than I do, this is the way in China to, to make binding important commitments. You put them in the five-year plan. So it's not necessarily all about passing legislation by parliaments. A lot of it is also um, action by, by governments through executive orders and, and, and similar interventions. So that's sort of the story of uh, how many climate change laws we can observe in the world. We then have those data points, 2000 plus data points, 2500 data points of climate laws. And we can start to ask questions such as when, what time, uh, at what time period were those laws passed? And just look at the, the timestamp of those laws. And you see that uh, this is really a story of the last 25, 30 years. Uh, not unexpectedly, there was very little climate change legislation uh, before that. There's some energy efficiency laws that are relevant to climate change that predate this time period, but mostly climate action is a story of the last uh, 20 years or so, perhaps the, the last 30 years. The peak in legislative activity is actually uh, happened well before the Paris Agreement. We sort of like to think that uh, Paris was the sort of the, the international treaty that focused the minds and uh, got countries to take action on climate change. And that's partly true. It's true in the sense that uh, legislators went home from Paris and started strengthening their laws. But uh, it, often the, the sort of the key framework legislation, the key basis for, for taking climate action was, was already in place to, to sort of the peak climate uh, peak climate law was sort of in the period 2009 to 13, if you will. So associated more with the Copenhagen uh, climate um, summit in 2009. So 
this isn't a, a sort of a, a statement of clear uh, causality, but it does seem that climate legislation was an enabling factor for the Paris Agreement. Uh, countries went to Paris in the knowledge that they had set up certain structures uh, on climate change that made it easier for them to, to agree on, 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 on the Paris Treaty's objectives rather than the other way around and the, the, the laws sort of follow the treaty. Uh, so that's one thing we can look at. We can, we can look at the time frame when, when laws were passed. Another thing we can look at if we look at those uh, uh, 2,000, 2,500 laws is who passed them, which political parties passed those laws. And if you're an observer of um, US uh, climate uh, uh, politics, maybe Canadian, maybe Australian climate politics, there is a, a perception from those Anglo-Saxon, Anglophone countries that climate action is a sort of a, a preoccupation of the political left and the political right tends to be more uh, reluctant, more lukewarm about climate change action. That's sort of, that's the perception you have if you, if you look at the Anglo-Saxon uh, climate change debates, but that certainly is the case. But if you look at the global debate, uh, you find that climate action is actually a very bipartisan activity. And the way to sort of show that is in, 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 in that little chart here on the right, uh, we calculated for each political persuasion, left-wing governments, centre governments, or right-wing governments, we calculated in each country what was the share of those governments, what was their time in office. And so they share, that their share in office was then compared to their share of climate laws that they have passed. And we put those two things in relation. So if uh, uh, the, the left wing, uh, the, the Labour government in the UK, the political left, was in power for half the time we looked at, it's, it's sort of the last uh, 20 years or so, if, if the left was in power for half the time and they passed half the climate laws in the UK, then they, the UK would get a, an indicator of one. Uh, if uh, the left passed uh, only half uh, the uh, quarter of the climate laws by being in office half the time, they would get an indicator of 0.5. So we looked at that indicator and you see the distribution uh, of, of, uh, of that indicator across the, the, the countries in the samples, the 190 or so countries in the sample. And you see that the histogram, the distribution, um, roughly centers around one, um, both in the left and in the right wing governments. and, 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 and uh, also for uh, governments of the center. Um, it is the case that the number of climate laws that are being passed is roughly in proportion to the uh, years in office of uh, parties of that political persuasion. So outside the Anglosphere, we can conclude that the uh, climate change action is a very bipartisan um, activity. Every political party passes climate change laws and they pass them in proportion to their time in office. Where they might change or might differ is the, their approach to climate action. Right-wing parties might rely more on market instruments, for example. Left-wing parties might rely more on, on regulation and state intervention and spending. But the sort of objective of doing something about climate change isn't driven, globally speaking, uh, by, by political persuasion. That, for me, is a very powerful result because it isn't what, uh, what you necessarily would expect by just reading the newspaper. Another question is, um, when in the economic cycle are climate change laws passed? There is a sense, and we are currently going through that, uh, through a phase like that, uh, when economic times are hard, if the economy is in a recession, if there's lots of unemployment, people are worried about their jobs, interest in climate action uh, wanes and interest in climate action is reduced. Um, this is despite um, the rhetoric that many of uh, you will, will be familiar with, that we heard a lot of during COVID, the story of building back better, the story of using government spending 
post-COVID uh, to, to not just kickstart the economy, but to also uh, kickstart the path towards zero carbon uh, prosperity. Uh, it is, and we then look at the, um, the, the when we then look at the economic cycle in, within which climate change laws are passed, we sort of find out that the building back better story actually doesn't really hold. It is the case that when economic times are difficult, uh, uh, lawmakers become more reluctant to take climate action. We built the same indicator as we had before. So that's an indicator where we divide the number of laws passed by uh, in times of good economic times and bad economic times, and we divide that uh, by by the, the, the you know the, the length of time we were in a recession or in a boom. And you see in this case the indicator is well below one. So it is the case that uh, we in the OECD uh, uh, context that we countries pass fewer climate laws in difficult economic times. Um, okay, I have to speed up a little bit and sort of start asking what is the content of those laws uh, and a lot of those laws set processes and institutions so it isn't all about sort of regulation and policies a lot of climate laws put in place responsibilities set up new institutions and this chart here is from from Dubar Shedal in science last year which uh, classifies the type of institutions and the type of processes that climate laws put in place they have to do with policy coordination, they could have to do with building consensus, or they could have to do with, with developing strategy. And uh, climate laws do all of these things, and sometimes they put uh, institutions in place that already exist. That's the layered column that you have there in the middle. In the United States, for example, and coordination on climate change was made the responsibility of the Environmental Protection Agency, the powerful existing uh, organization. Sometimes new organizations are put in place. Um, in the UK, you see there at the bottom, the Committee on Climate Change, the Climate Change Committee, which is a new organization created by the Climate Change Act, which was put in charge to develop strategy and, and monitor progress on climate change. So one of the things that climate change laws do is, is um, setting up those processes, setting up those institutions within which policy then happens. Another thing climate change laws do is that they do actually uh, put in place particular public policy interventions, particular measures that help to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions or increase, increase our resilience to climate impacts. And they can be grouped into sort of three broad categories. As an economist, uh, I spend a lot of my time arguing about putting a price on carbon, and globally is about a, a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions are subject to a carbon price. Carbon price isn't just an economic, uh, isn't just justified by economic arguments, uh, the economic argument being that you want to uh, uh, have to signal the damage, the environmental damage reflected in the price signal. There's also legal arguments that say the polluter must pay. This is a well-established principle of environmental policy uh, that you make polluters pay. And climate laws reflect uh, those sorts of either economic or, or, or policy uh, 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 principles. Uh, but just putting a price on carbon, just internalizing the climate externality, as economists would call it, isn't enough because there are other barriers, there are other reasons why climate uh, change action doesn't happen. And you need public policy enshrined in law, ideally, to deal with those associated barriers. Some of them are very well known. Uh, we know that clean innovation, investments in renewables, in electric vehicles, and so on, is held back by the market. The market underinvests in, 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 in those sorts of activities because innovation is a public good and markets under provide public goods. So we need policy interventions on clean technology. We need policy interventions on energy efficiency. This is a very long running story since the 1970s, since the first oil price shock. Uh, we have known and agonized and wondered why the energy use of households and firms 
is higher than the sort of most efficient energy use that engineers tell us would be possible. Uh, what are the barriers that, that make that uh, energy gap occur? And what are the policy interventions that, that, that could close it? So we have interventions often of a regulatory nature that deal with that. Uh, finance is an issue, a uh, barrier that needs to be overcome in climate change laws, uh, because the, the zero carbon economy is quite the capital intensive economy, and therefore constraints to capital, which exist generically, but those constraints are particularly important when it comes to decarbonization. Think of uh, an electric car or think of a solar panel. Those devices are quite expensive to buy. Uh, but they're then very cheap to run. Uh, so on a lifetime basis, the solar panel is probably as cheap as, as conventional electricity, but you need the money up front, you need the capital up front to buy it, and then you recoup that investment by having very low running cost. So that creates pressure on the financial system to actually provide, uh, provide that capital, and we need climate laws, and we need policymakers to intervene in the financial market to make sure there are no financial constraints. The final bucket of policy interventions that we find in climate laws has to do with sort of the unintended consequences and mitigating the side effects of climate action. And if you're talking about decarbonizing an entire economy, it's a deep structural change. And deep structural change always creates winners and losers. And we have to make sure that we look after the losers as well, the people who could potentially lose out from the transition to a, to a clean economy. There are ethical reasons. The main reasons why you would want to do that is, is, is just climate justice. It would be wrong um, to, uh, to sort of have workers in high carbon industries losing their jobs without help to transition into, into zero carbon jobs. It would be wrong to just increase electricity prices and have poor households uh, facing, facing those higher costs uh, without, without applying, uh, 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 offering any mitigating measures against that. But there's also a sort of a, a apart from the ethics, a sort of a, a, a political economy imperative. Uh, if you want the zero carbon transition to succeed, if you want buy-in from the population, uh, you need to uh, bring that population with you. You need to structure your policies in a way uh, that the population supports rather than creating pockets of resistance uh, that, that we often see when, when policy is sort of implemented in a, in a non-sensitive way. Um, the picture here is from the Gilets Jaunes protests in France, which is, a, is an example of a policy that was from an environmental point of view, absolutely rational, absolutely necessary, good thing to do, um, but implemented perhaps without uh, enough sensitivity towards the, the people. I promised you a, a, an aside, just one slide on climate litigation. And so let me finish this particular part of the, the talk, which is looking backwards about uh, how much climate policy we have seen by also giving you a slide of how much climate litigation we have seen over the last um, 20, 30 years or so. The same database, climate change laws of the world, that I introduced a couple of slides back, uh, which contains climate legislation, also has a, a tab that contains uh, court cases that contains climate litigation. And uh, there's about uh, 400 cases outside the US and about 1,000 cases within the United States. They go across the board, climate litig litigation quite broadly defined. Sometimes there are issues to do with planning permission. Sometimes there are issues to do with, with uh, uh, allocation of emission permits and, and issues like that. But some of them, some of those cases are strategic. They, they really go to the heart of how much climate action a country should do. And uh, there have been a couple of cases now where, where courts have ruled in favor of the environment, as it were, where courts have told uh, either companies like Shell or governments like Germany and the Netherlands that they do not do enough about climate change. 
And usually those those um, rulings come in, uh, are often they are based, and I'm sort of careful as an economist to talk to lawyers here, but often those those rulings are based on, on human rights grounds, on the, on the right of future generations to a stable climate. Uh, sometimes they have to do with damages, uh, but that's that's less often. So we start seeing those cases, and because again we have 1,400 data points to look at, as an economist, you're sort of interested uh, how often do judges rule in favor of the environment, how often do they rule against the environment, as it were. And the answer is it's, it's roughly 50-50. Uh, I once said it feels like the judges are tossing a coin and the, the, the lawyers in the audience got very angry and explained to me that no, judges don't toss coins, it's very deliberate careful legal uh, consideration, uh, but the outcome is as if it's a 50-50 chance if you start a climate litigation case, uh, whether you're going to win or whether you're going to lose. That is changing incidentally, and increasingly uh, courts are actually ruling in favor of the environment, but it's still, it's still not a, <clears throat> a sort of a, it's, it's still a gamble to some extent. So that's all I'm going to say about climate litigation. That's all I'm going to say about the backward look of climate legislation so far. Let me spend the, the last sort of 10 minutes or so I have before we go into Q&A uh, to talk about what have those laws actually achieved. If we look at, you know, uh, 30 years of climate legislation, 2,500 pieces of, of, of policy making, what has that effort actually achieved. And I'm going to uh, partly do that uh, globally looking at those 2000 laws, but I'm also going to look at one case, which is the UK Climate Change Act, because as I said, it's a, it's a good example of a framework law, of an overarching law that, that uh, puts in place the structures and the institutions uh, for climate change. And the UK law had five uh, sort of features in it that, that uh, experts often point out as particularly impactful, particularly important, particularly meaningful for climate action. The first one was it put in, in, in law, it put on in statute uh, a long-term target uh, of, of greenhouse gas emissions for the UK. Back in 2008, that target was an 80% reduction uh, from 1990 level. Uh, that was later revised in 2019. That target was revised to net zero by 2050. But an important feature of those framework laws in the UK Act in particular is to set that direction of travel, to make it absolutely clear and put in law what the end point is, what the objective is of climate action. A second uh, important feature of, the, of a good climate law and of the UK law is that the long-term target is too far in the future for most decision makers, uh, politicians think in terms of the next elections, uh, CEOs of companies sort of think in, in, in you know, terms of uh, the next reporting cycle, so much, much more short term. So we need to complement the long term direction of travel with binding targets that are consistent with the decision making horizon of, of, of those, of those uh, decision makers. So in the UK, this takes the form of five year binding uh, carbon budgets. Those are, again, statutory, they're put in law. And they set the constraint about how much carbon, how many greenhouse gases the country across the economy is allowed to emit over a particular five year period. And we've currently enacted six of those budgets. Uh, they go ahead in time. That's important so people can plan. Um, we're, we're in budget number three at the moment, and we have enacted budgets uh, four, five, and six as well. So we know what the decarbonization plan is in the UK all the way to the mid 2030s. So that helps people making planning uh, decisions and investment decisions. Uh, a third aspect of the Climate Change Act that's important and worth mentioning is it doesn't just deal with emissions. It also deals with the physical risks of climate change with the need to adapt to climate change impacts that we can no longer avoid. And that is done through a, a sort of a, a, a cycle of five yearly climate change risk assessments, 
that are then followed by a, a national adaptation program. So it's this sort of iterative planning of assessing the risks, then having a plan to deal with them, then assess the risks again in light of what that plan has achieved and so on. So that's an important part of climate legislation, not just emissions, but also adaptation. The fourth element that's really crucial in the UK climate change context has to be the creation of new institutions. Remember the, the slide I, I showed you two, three slides ago of processes and institutions. In the case of the UK, a very important uh, new institution was created called the Climate Change Committee. Uh, it's a, a committee of, of technocrats, of independent experts um, that create a sort of a safeguard against political thinking, political opportunism, political short-termism. Uh, you can think of the sort of ideas equivalent to monetary policy, where deliberately interest rates are not set by politicians because they would be worried by short-term concerns, but it's set, interest rates are set by um, technocrats, by, by uh, uh, central banks. So this is in a sense a sort of an equivalent institutional structure in the Climate Change Act. And finally, there are very clear duties, powers, deadlines, responsibilities in the Act. So it's very, very clear who has to do what, when. So that's the Climate Change Act in the UK. Uh, then look at what has that institutional structure actually achieved. And the first thing it's achieved, and this is uh, insights from actually talking to policymakers who were uh, who were involved in the climate debate over the first 10 years of, the, of the, the life of the Climate Change Act. And one of the things they said was the, the political debate has, has improved. The, the, the policy debate about climate change has become much more structured, much more routine, much better informed. The reason for that is um, because the Climate Change Act sets deadlines and, and, and has sort of statutory expectations at the end of June, there has to be a report put before Parliament about progress. Everybody knows it, and you sort of organize your, your life around it if you're a climate change expert. That's sort of when you, when you make your interventions. But then there's also the role of that Committee on Climate Change, again, that independent body that is now uh, a really trusted um, custodian of analytical truth, if there's such a thing as analytical truth, custodian of... Um, uh, analytical rigor uh, of, of information, of data that is being used by, on all sides of the debate. So through those institutional tweaks, those simple but insightful institutional tweaks, um, the UK debate on climate change has become more evidence-based, more structured. The political consensus has uh, probably also been enforced through having the Climate Change Act. That's a slightly more difficult statement to make, but the Climate Change Act was passed by overwhelming majority. It was only about three members of parliament who voted against it back in 2008. And that sort of consensus has held plus minus on and off uh, over the, uh, the subsequent 13, 14 years. And the reason, for, and, and those 13 years have actually been quite, uh, you know, uh, eventful. We've had about we've had five governments over those 13 years, uh, four general elections, and quite a lot of political crises, the global financial crisis, we had Brexit, we had COVID, and we now have the war in Ukraine. So it's, it's quite a lot going on, but the, the commitment to climate action, to net zero, has actually held. It's sort of not been perfect. There's always a, a, a faction in Parliament to grumble against uh, climate action, but so far the Climate Change Act has sort of kept that opposition at bay. It's partly done that because people have invested political capital into the Climate Change Act, but it's partly also because the institutional architecture of the Act makes it difficult, deliberately makes it difficult to, uh, to avoid back political sort of backsliding. That's, that's made difficult. If you have a legal a climate target set in law, reversing that target uh, involves quite a lot of political capital and, and, and so it doesn't happen or it hasn't happened yet. So that's uh, another sort of 
benefit of the Climate Change Act. Uh, but the thing that really matters in the end, ultimately, is what has climate change legislation done to emissions? That's what the ultimate yardstick is. And in the case of the UK, this chart here shows that uh, the UK is one of a few countries that have decoupled GDP growth from emissions. Uh, you sort of see how GDP, the, the green line here since 1990, has gone up by something like 80%, perhaps, with a little blip uh, in the recession of 2008-9. And while GDP has gone up by 80%, emissions have gone down by something like 40%, a little bit more than 40%. That's true whether you measure emissions uh, in production terms, the, uh, the territorial emissions, or in, in consumption terms to sort of embedded carbon in what uh, we consume in the UK. Uh, if you turn those two statistics to the green line of GDP and the yellow and gray lines on emissions into an emissions intensity, uh, you find out that in the UK, we now emit three times less carbon per unit of GDP than we did in 1990. Uh, and that's quite a sort of a staggering statistic. Has the Climate Change Act played a role in that? Yes, it has, uh, because the emission reductions accelerated after the Act was passed, but it's not the only factor. Obviously, emission reductions predate the Climate Change Act, and some other factors have played a role. Just to de, um, what's the word? So to disaggregate uh, those effects a little bit, we, we again ran some statistics over those 2000 uh, climate change laws and be asked how much have those climate change laws uh, reduced emissions? You can statistically, if you have 2000 data points, 130 countries over 20 years, uh, a panel data set, you can identify what those climate change laws have done in terms of emissions. And you can then contrast that to the actual emission reductions we've observed. And you see that climate change legislation has made a very tangible impact to reducing emissions. This is the G7 we looked at in this particular chart, a very tangible impact to reducing emissions, but other extraneous factors have also played a role. In the UK in particular, uh, that 40% reduction, 42% reduction actually in emissions that we've observed. Um, we see here that the, the policy induced change to right light green Bar is only about 17 percentage point, and other uh, external economic, socioeconomic changes is 25 uh, percentage point. So more than half of the UK success in reducing emissions is actually things like the dash for gas, they're closing down coal, which had to do with uh, market developments, has to do with uh, uh, the move into a service economy, the offshoring of, of, of high uh, energy sectors and factors like that. Similar story true in, for example, the United States, where emission reductions are uh, in a large part the effect of the advent of, of shale gas, uh, as much as they were the result of climate policy. Contrast that with, for example, Germany and Japan and Canada to the right of the chart, where climate policy has had powerful effects, particularly in Germany, uh, but those powerful effects were partly offset by other economic, socioeconomic decisions. For example, the attitude of new, towards nuclear in the case of Japan and Germany, or the, uh, the, the, the tar sands of Canada that were being exploited. So climate policy, climate legislation has to be complemented by a sort of a, an overarching approach uh, to economic policy that the sort of the, the two areas of policy interventions have to talk to each other. Let me finish with just this chart here, which is a glass half full, glass half empty story. If you look globally, how much has climate change legislation achieved in terms of emission reductions um, between 1999 and 2016, which is what we looked at? Um, you can sort of see that uh, emissions uh, in, that's the waterfall chart on, on the right here, Emissions in 1999 were about 23 billion tons of CO2, that's just CO2 emissions only. And if it had not been for climate change interventions, um, those emissions would have gone up by 
almost 16 billion pounds uh, by 2016. But because we had climate uh, laws, we had those uh, uh, that uh, concerted climate action in all countries. Um, about a third of that emissions increase was, was avoided, about 5.8 billion tons of emissions were avoided. So the actual increase wasn't 15.7 uh, uh, gigatons, it was only about 10 gigatons. So the difference was uh, the benefit of climate action, if you will, or the effect of climate action. 5.8 gigatons a year, is that a lot of carbon? Well, it is. It is about the uh, uh, annual CO2 emissions. It's more than the annual CO2 emissions of the United States, and the United States is the second biggest emitters. So we avoided a second United States by all the climate change action that we have taken. Uh, on aggregate, over the whole period, not annually, but over the whole period, 1999 to 2016, this, this translates into about 38 gigatons of carbon that we have avoided which is about one year worth of emission, one year's worth of emissions that climate legislation has avoided uh, over that time period. So again, that's a lot, that's good, that's an entire year, but compared to the carbon budgets we have left, compared to the chart we had right in the beginning, which talked about reducing emissions by 50% over the next 10 years, uh, 5.8 gigatons is 15.15% of uh, emissions. So we have to move from 15 to 50 in terms of the emission reductions that we still have ahead of us. So glass half full, climate legislation does work. Glass half empty, we have to do a lot more than we have so far. Let me stop here. Let me stop sharing the screen so I can see you again. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fankhauser, for this absolutely fascinating and comprehensive lecture. We have been really uh, highlighted uh, with different uh, relationships and effects uh, of climate change and uh, different uh, factors. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, now we are on the questions uh, section and uh, AJ will help us now for the questions. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Professor uh, Fankhauser for uh, his excellent presentation. Many thanks and uh, thanks to all uh, participants. Uh, the first question is coming from Ms. Martina Iacoboni. And Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your lecture. Your lecture has been very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think about strategic climate litigation? Um, do you think that it is useful or that it lacks a more global approach that is needed for such complex and collective problems? It's a, it's a very good question for me. It's, it's one of the sort of most exciting sort of developments of the last Two, three years is the increased interest of courts in climate change issues. Um, so for me, it's a, it's, it's a big development. I think it, it, it's a big sort of defining incentive for both governments and, and, and for corporates to do that. Just to <clears throat> give you a, a bit of flavor why, why I'm saying that, when we interviewed um, policymakers uh, for this study of what has the Climate Change Act in the UK, achieved, government officials were petrified about being taken to court. But really sort of the threat of a judicial review uh, was something that they absolutely did not want to happen. They, they thought the reputational damage was just too big. At the same time, the Climate Change Act doesn't have any sort of sanctions in it. So it does rely on the courts um, telling the government what to do. So for those two reasons, I think uh, uh, climate litigation has a, has a big role to play. And we're starting to see more of it, as, 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 as we said before. We've seen the German case. We've seen the, the Dutch Ukenda case. There's, there's much more of that coming. Thank you very much. Uh, we may uh, invite our participants to raise their hands. If uh, they want to submit any questions. Uh, currently, we don't have any other questions in uh, the chat box. Uh, 
maybe I can uh, take this opportunity <laughs> to uh, ask a professor uh, a question. Uh, uh, professor, you have mentioned uh, an independent committee uh, in the uh, established uh, in the UK Climate Change Act. Uh, how uh, maybe can you uh, give some details about its function and uh, uh, is it effective? Uh, its decision are their uh, decisions effective uh, or binding? Uh... Yeah, good. Let me let me say a little bit about that. And I should, for full disclosure, I used to be a member of it, so I'm I'm slightly uh, slightly biased in my assessment of the climate change committee. But I think most. UK observers would say it's been a, a really, really important part of the, the landscape, a, a really important part of why the UK has been able to play a leadership role on emission reductions. The committee structure has been replicated in, in other countries. The, Australia has a climate change commission, New Zealand has a climate change commission. Uh, I think Sweden has one and, and various other countries do. And the UK one has been influential and successful for a for a number of reasons uh, one is cultural that there have always been a sort of a, a willingness in the uk political debate to set up those expert bodies they don't just exist on climate change there's a national infrastructure commission for example there's the Fuel poverty commission and, and so on so culturally this is something that we are familiar with in the uk it then worked because it's a commission of independent experts and they're perceived as both of these things as independent and as experts so it isn't uh, you know representatives of particular opinions or particular regions or particular interests those are experts those are people who are on the committee because they understand the subject matter and that sort of clarity that analytical clarity that it, that this provides has been hugely important and that independence and the sort of acknowledgement that this is independent advice as opposed to lobbying uh, that has been hugely hugely important and everybody is using the sort of the same evidence that's the sort of fascinating thing we had a a, a talk last week here in oxford by a, a senior, senior uk government official talking about climate change and he didn't use the statistics of his own department, he used the statistics of the Independent Climate Change Committee. Uh, I've been to presentations by, show, by oil companies, uh, a sort of fracking related discussion, and they used the same evidence, they used the evidence of the Climate Change Committee. So it's really used very, very broadly, um, and that has made a huge difference. The difference has to do with the fact that it's independent, it's rigorous, it's uh, uh, sort of evidence-based, and that really is is, is 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 a crucial sort of addition to the landscape in the UK. Thank thank you so much, uh, Professor. And we have uh, one more question from Mr. Leonard uh, Wegener. You're on mute, Leonard. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to... Okay, now, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah, thank you very much for organizing this event, first of all, and also thank you, Professor Fankhauser, for these uh, interesting insights into your research. I um, am very much interested in, um, in the relationship between the um, the, in, the processes at the international level um, under the Paris Agreement, especially the communication of NDCs, um, and uh, on the other hand, the domestic policy processes that you um, uh, are mentioning, the legislation processes. Um, so, for example, you mentioned that uh, in the UK uh, Climate Change Act, there is, are these five-year cycles to, um, to, to determine a carbon budget. And well, um, we all know that there is are these uh, five-year cycles under the Paris Agreement to renew um, NDCs. Um, so um, in a bit in that direction, um, how can we observe uh, the interrelationship between um, 
what is communicated at the international level under the Paris Agreement and what is um, determined in domestic policy processes. Um, could you yeah, elaborate a bit on, on your observations in that regard? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. I mean, the first thing I would say this is an interesting sort of philosophical uh, similarity between the sort of the Paris structure, which says we have this you know five year stock takes and ratcheting up <clears throat> mechanisms, and the UK Climate Change Act has five year carbon budgets. So that sort of iterative decision making. Uh, is, is being found in, in, in the Paris Agreement and in the National UK Climate Act. Most other climate change acts actually don't, they haven't mimicked or, or copied or, or adopted that, um, that five-year budget approach. Uh, most countries outside the UK, they just have 2030 targets and those sorts of things. Um, the, 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 the sort of interplay, in addition, obviously we know NDCs are um you know they don't have any legal force as it were they're nationally determined so countries can kind of say what they want and so one of the questions uh, the international community then has is uh, how credible is an ndc did you know did the country really mean it when they when they submitted those targets and that's where national climate legislation comes in because it it provides that uh, uh, it provides evidence of, of, of that, uh, that commitment by the, by the country. In the case of the UK, the NDC that the UK submitted just before the Glasgow COP was actually, it wasn't a sort of a document provided for the UNFCCC. It was the sixth carbon budget. It was the, you know, the, the legislative thing that had to happen and was passed by parliament, and, and this is on the statute books, and that became the UK's NDC. So you can say uh, it isn't just you know, a random communication by a government. It is something that went through a process in the country and was approved by parliament. That gives it much more credibility as a, as a, as a commitment than, than other NDCs would have. Doesn't make it certain. Because one of the issues we have seen in the UK is that disconnect between targets and policies to deliver them. And that's absolutely something we do observe. And that gets us back to the role of, of courts uh, and, and the sort of scrutiny uh, from, from outside sources. Uh, we need the government to uh, actually even, even, even live up to the legislated targets. That still has to happen, but at least they're legislated and they're part of a process. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Mary uh, Kateri raised her hand. If... Oh, you're muted now. Thank you very much, Professor, for such an informative uh, presentation. My question relates to um, the role of women in tackling climate change. I'm not sure if it's coming out from the policy prescripts and legislative prescripts that are coming out. So I'm not sure if you have done research in that area, but uh, that's my question. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mary. Such a good question. I wish I had a good answer for it. Uh, it's, to, to be honest, I, I'm not aware of any sort of systematic analysis to, uh, to see what, uh, what the role of women has been in climate legislation. Anecdotally, we, we all know that, uh, that uh, you know, certainly in the UK, but probably in other countries as well, that uh, women opinion leaders have been hugely influential in, in, uh, in promoting this debate, but uh, I haven't seen a sort of a a more statistical, if you will, uh, analysis of, of, of the role of, of, of female uh, opinion leaders. What we do know, of course, is that climate change is gendered. So climate change impacts are disproportionately felt by, uh, by vulnerable groups and include, uh, disproportionately felt by, by women. Uh, we, we know from extreme events, from disasters, that this is the case, that the death rate amongst women is, is greater, for example, uh, from against floods and hurricanes than it is for men. 
So um, we know we have a, an issue that is gendered, um, but I don't know to what extent the solution has been gendered as well. I hope it was. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I see no other questions now. And if uh, no new questions, I would like to leave the floor to Professor Achikel again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now uh, we come to the uh, end of uh, time allocated to us uh, for the seminar. I would like to thank everyone in the audience for their uh, questions and uh, to Professor uh, for his uh, answers. I hope everyone uh, enjoyed today's lecture. We wish you stick with us uh, on our uh, next seminar uh, in April. Uh, please send us an email to cclab at uh, kahas at edu, uh, dot, uh, tr if you wish to be included uh, in our emailing list for our future events. And Professor uh, Fenkhauser, right. before we finish, uh, it's over to you for uh, your closing words. I have said everything I wanted to say other than thanking you for joining me this morning. Thank you for spending time with me. Thank you for your questions. And thank you for the invitation as well. I look forward to see how, uh, how your work progresses. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And uh, goodbye. <laughs>